Great. So, um, so the next um, uh, introduction to make in a few minutes is to Professor Nick Race, a principal investigator on the academic side, and he will lead you through the content of the day and uh, describe the architecture from a business and technical point of view. So you can see how the various parts of today and the themes hang together and how they link to the overall ambition that Tim has talked about. I just want to say about the a little about the day and the project uh, main elements. So in the morning, um, we're going to have uh, the five talks, one from Nick and one from four more of the principal academics in the programme to introduce the, the main themes, which I'll talk about in a second. Uh, the afternoon will be the breakout sessions where we're hoping that uh, you will be able to um, let, lay before us some further um, opportunities for downstreaming and collaboration uh, in, in cross BT, um, both uh, point uh, opportunities, but also what, what stepping stones, what pieces do we need to build together to, to create that future? So that's the shape of the day. And we want three sorts of conversation out of the day. Um, one is awareness. So um, what questions arise in your mind um, during the day? Who else? What other colleagues should be involved? Um, what didn't you understand? What would you like to follow up on? What can we expand upon? So we want this to grow from the conversation today uh, towards uh, the event um, that we have next and actually build the conversation across BT. We still have uh, a year of the project to run and time to respond um, and, and sort of focus work on the main issues. Um, there's point opportunities. So what opportunities have we missed? Uh, each of the technologies has perhaps a broader application than the use cases that we've hit on so far, uh, working with colleagues across BT. Um, we've chosen applications that make sense to us and to them, uh, but may have missed others, and you may see particular problems that uh, technologies could apply to. So please tell us about those things and give us perhaps uh, new and expanded downstreaming opportunities and, and new challenges. You know, what, what are we not issues that we've not thought of that we may need to take into account? And finally, the transformation of the business that when we join all this together, which we need to do to get the full benefit, you know, what are the barriers? Um, how can we re-engineer re the business from a people and the technological point of view? And, and that's a big ambition, but what are the first steps, the, uh, um, you know, the, the things that will make the subsequent steps easier because we've prepared the ground? So we hope, um, as Tim said, to run the in-person event. I think today's been a great lesson in the, the value of in-person events. Um, online gives us the advantage that we've uh, been able to connect people perhaps uh, through a wider geography across the globe, which is nice. Um, but uh, obviously in person we can uh, bring new flavours to it. And if we can focus those conversations towards that, then um, that will help us hit the ground running uh, when we have the in-person event whenever we can. Um, so um, Tim asks, uh, what does this mean for customers? What does it mean for operations, the business? What does it mean for colleagues? And of course, full solutions are an intimate mix of technology and people. Um, so we need to take a complete view to understand how this operates. Uh, a resilient and dynamic infrastructure has to be bedded into a resilient and dynamic human organization. And so how this infrastructure will connect with, with colleagues and customers and enable them to achieve mutual benefit. You know, what, what are those connections uh, like? Um, so all the stakeholders across the business timescales need a voice in how the infrastructure works and to stay informed about how it's performing and have some level of control. Uh, and smarter decisions and smarter operations happen when we can sort of coordinate between those different business domains. And new technology gives us the opportunity to do this in, in new ways. Um, so here's a quick tour of the main features of our vision. Uh, looking, taking the perspective of looking at the main stakeholders at each stage in the business life cycle. The first one shown here is to increase the rate of market experimentation, then define and roll out services, and then deliver frictionless rollouts and grow and shrink capacity according to demand. Uh, we need interfaces uh, and languages which make sense to what customers and our business understands, and to deploy that into a software given. Um, sort of driven infrastructure and uh, to, to take, have continuous um, updates to that. So operating at a higher level um, and less sort of low level detail to get our sort of ankles caught up in uh, and technology can help here. 
And our vision then, and, and some of the demos you'll see, uh, then pass this over to autonomic control, which is distributed through the infrastructure. So this in fact, maintains the performance to the best possible uh, in the dynamic real world of networks. So traffic surges, um, errors, you know, outages, some sort of you know, um, disasters, weather, um, which and those autonomic controls learn um, from their behavior and from their infrastructure and from their measures of success, um, uh, the best responses to make in any given circumstance. And it's also the uh, technology's responsibility to understand when it has not seen this situation before and should not take an action. And therefore, according to some sort of uh, metric and threshold, it passes over to human intervention to um, in operations or analysis or even a, a kind of truck roll into the network. And at this point, who actually makes that determination where those thresholds are? Because that affects the demand on our engineering resource and it affects the customer. So that's a matter for customer experience and operations um, to, um, to be involved in the conversation, to explore the cost and the impacts uh, and using some of the risk models that we're looking at. Um, and of course, that expands the conversation because in fact, um, those things determine the SLA and the price. And so that in fact is part of the discussion uh, with customers and, and the um, CFUs uh, in the original um, definition of the service and the, the risk levels and the uh, SLAs is um, how do we keep ahead? So um, learning again from uh, the network and from other sources of information, we uh, build, for example, digital twins on top, which are there to allow um, investment and, and rollout planning and customer impacts to explore uh, what would happen in certain circumstances? You know, um, what if we uh, are looking at perhaps new services with different sorts of demands on the uh, network and the software capabilities? Um, uh, what about surges in traffic? Um, what about disasters um, or, or uh, pandemics, which suddenly uh, expand the, the requirement on the network? Um, so it helps us to understand the plausible futures that we're trying to be able to contain and, and manage. And so the conversation widens yet further with models. For, and one simple example is, is where to place the, the um, balance between proact proactive uh, maintenance and reactive maintenance. So how much do we want to um, invest ahead in um, sort of extra volume in the network or, or engineering um, um, sort of scheduling that heads problems off before they hit customers uh, versus w waiting for a customer to tell us and, and reacting. And that you know, impacts investment timescales and also customer impact timescales, uh, all of which we can sort of explore and then pass that to the autonomic control to manage for us. And then finally, how do we hang this all together? That we need perhaps um, new sort of roles in the company, uh, new information flows such that the decisions made actually are holistic and um, sort of take into account all these aspects as we go and iteratively rather than building a, um, a solution which we're then stuck with to allow us to be able to alter those uh, checks and balances and, and uh, customer and price points as we go and not fix those in, into the infrastructure. So looking at the uh, four themes for today, the first one um, is uh, intent-based networks and DevOps, which is about exploring these opportunities. Um, the, the next one is um, anomaly detection um, for dynamic infrastructures. And the third one is prognostics for service assurance, which looks at those um, economic balances. And then fourthly, the governance and risk management. So I hope you take interest in those topics and that you um, uh, sort of listen attentively to the uh, four uh, talks from the academics this morning and enter as many of those uh, discussion rooms as you are interested in in the afternoon and do help us look for those opportunities and look for opportunities also to link these together in the way that I've described. So uh, I'm now going to pass over to um, uh, Professor Nick Race for more details of the architecture. Um, and uh, so Nick is Professor of Network Systems at Lancaster and an old friend of, of BT. Uh, having worked on his PhD project um, 
way, way back um, in BT research, uh, right here in inverted commas, uh, in Industrial Park. So um, thank you very much, Nick, and uh, over to you. Uh, thanks, Stephen, very much for that introduction. Yes, I was um, back back in. Well, that's showing my age now. Back in back in the mid '90s, uh, working in BT's futures testbed and working on all the research on on IPv6 at the time. So, so that was very much uh, a core part of what I was doing in the early days with the business. So it's it's great to be back and talking about. Uh, this this exciting new project NGCDI with um, with everyone here today. So so thank you firstly from from my side for everyone to to join today. It's um it's really exciting to be able to talk to many parts of the business. We've had lots of conversations already with folks, so it's really good to be able to kind of expand those conversations. Um, so as Stephen said, I'm the principal investigator on the academic side of next generation converged digital infrastructure. So NGCDI for short. And, and today we're very much focused on a spotlight on that word infrastructure, and in particular, future network infrastructure. And so the ambition of NGCDI is all about creating a, a future infrastructure, which as far as possible is able to configure and be reconfigured rapidly. So for example, you don't have to add or replace equipment to enable new services that we just didn't anticipate. So how can we, we go about achieving that? Well, we need a number of different technologies to help us here. So we can start by orchestrating software. We should be able to deliver services optimized for the delivery network, whether that's fixed or mobile, taking advantage of 5 and 6G technology to deliver new capabilities such as low latency and, and enabling new real-time services. In addition to that, we, we can take advantage of automation and autonomics, enabling the infrastructure as far as possible to look after and optimize its own performance, uh, maintaining cost and service goals set by the business and its customers. And we can also introduce new agility in the infrastructure built on, um, as Tim mentioned, network functions, virtualization, and, and even kind of micro NFE type technologies. What we also need is a knowledge layer, so we, we can design a knowledge framework to help better understand the underlying infrastructure, what's happening, and then take autonomous actions. And then, of course, finally, um, we, we can't do this without considering the humans and working with humans and the business to look at how an organization puts trust in any of these approaches and addresses concerns around risk management. So as Tim introduced briefly, um, NGCDI is a prosperity partnership. So it's a five million pound prosperity partnership um, between four academic institutions, four universities across the UK. Um, and those universities all bring different skill sets. It's a multidisciplinary research team um, in the areas of future telecoms. So that's Lancaster, Surrey and Bristol, industrial automation from Cambridge, statistics from Lancaster, and organizational behavior at Cambridge. So it's, it's very much a multidisciplinary team that's joined together here to work on this, this huge challenge. So let's think a little bit more around architecture and what do we need in a future architecture um, to deliver the sorts of agility that we've talked about so far? Well, we, we need an architecture that can deal economically with complexity at scale. So that might be providing frictionless scaling of capacity and enabling the business to manage complexity in completely new ways um, through more efficient policies and the use of, of intents. We need to manage multi-party requirements that may be network operators, service providers, content providers, industry verticals, etc. So negotiation and formalization of those requirements to enable automatic deployment and operation. We also need an architecture that has greater agility, so supporting new products and trialing and what if modeling so we can assess the viability of new products and services and provide a capability to capture emergent processes and inventory changes. Of course, we need to focus on uh, exi existing customer service levels and balance investment timescales and enabling a greater focus on the customer by basing those decisions on greater knowledge of the business and the balances of the business. We need to connect with existing and new processes. We need to identify the data that we need from the infrastructure that's needed to trigger engineering processes. We need to identify the information controls offered by the infrastructure 
that will then engender trust in the operational business personnel. And then finally, we need new mechanisms to understand and flex and those managed risks. So support a wider view of decision making by understanding and modelling the business balances between cost, service, agility to respond, robustness and resilience and the deployment of all those types of policy changes right into the infrastructure. OK, so that gives you a sense of some of the, the architectural needs. And um, let's now focus on in, in these next few slides a glimpse into our NGCDI architecture designed to meet those aims that I've just outlined. And we'll start by taking a very simplified view of the main features of the architecture before drilling a little bit into, into some more detail. So first that we need ways of stimulating and building in new requirements, deploying into and monitoring and controlling the infrastructure through a knowledge layer. So of course, we've got multiple requirements need to be considered. Some of their, those may be a tension. There may be tensions between costs and service levels. They also cover uh, functional, non-functional, uh, such as performance SLAs and, and risk cost balances. Um, these are then modeled and formalized through interaction and modeling with a knowledge layer, which is based on the data that we get from that converged infrastructure. And then those are deployed into the infrastructure itself. Of course, as a result, we may see customer demand satisfied, um, but of course, then we get surges in demand. We, we need to manage in real time. And also we have the environment, we have events, the external events, such as weather, faults, et cetera. And so the infrastructure needs to keep the knowledge layer updated and those triggers and thresholds then alert business processes as appropriate. And that, that's a mix of human and machine, so desk and, and field based. And then the first decision of a control system algorithm is to discriminate and decide. And so this, this dotted line down is all around deciding which actions it can take automa autom automatically and which actually need human intervention. And then on the dotted line up, there also needs to be appropriate checks in the whole system is continuing to offer and deliver business value. And that takes a mix of internal triggers from the system and external monitoring of the, say, market environment. So let's now drill a little bit further into this from an NGCDI perspective and, and take you through a, a full life cycle, if you like, of the NGCDI architecture. So first up, we have business intents, an area that we'll be talking about a little bit more detail later on. And we can expect that the requirements will change and evolve at an ever increasing pace. And so we need smarter ways to negotiate those requirements and costs between multiple parties and deliver them into the infrastructure. And that may involve simulations before we actually deploy. So not only for the service functionality, but also for service levels um, and what they mean for costs and capacity investments. And then iterating the requirements through simulations results in machine readable intents, which can then be used to automatically orchestrate software based network and service functions and, and then get deployed into that infrastructure. The agreed service levels need to be managed dynamically and in the real world there'll be disturbances such as those surges in traffic demand we mentioned or equipment failures and some of those events will be manageable automatically by self-learning software agents which then in real time can find the best available balance between the various requirements and then well how does that self-learning take place well we need control algorithms that we're developing to to use those network events traffic telemetry etc to learn about problem states uh, network elements uh, remaining etc um, and then this updates the agents accordingly to self-optimize the service level intents autonomic capability will be distributed through different domains for example many aspects of the 5g network will be self-optimizing but we know that centralized controls are likely to scale. So to support key business functions, um, we need sufficient representation of the knowledge needed. And then at a business level, as you can see from the left of the picture, we've been really focused on developing an architecture to automate as much as possible the flow from requirements to deployment. But to the upper and right side of the diagram, we're building greater capability for managing the service infrastructure. And that's all about how we augment that human decision making at a business level. So I'm going to take you through three and four of the key areas that we'll be, we'll be focusing on today 
um, around key topics um, that have been developed as part of the activity within the overall architecture. And the first of those relates to the detection of anomalies for dynamic infrastructure. And here the challenge is all about detecting those anomalies in massive real-time online data flows in order to diagnose network or operational problems. And as part of the project, we've developed new statistical techniques that are able to monitor very large data streams and identify anomalies in near real time. And so um, coming up uh, after this presentation, uh, Idris from Lancaster University, we were talking about anomaly detection for dynamic infrastructure. The second key area uh, relates to intent-based networking and DevOps. And as we've talked about, increasing the rate of delivery and the value of new services is going to need smarter ways to capture customer needs and translate those needs into service definition and delivery. And so the research within NGCDI is investigating the capture of those business and customer intents that can then be translated into a machine readable form. And so then at 11.15, after a, a short break, um, Idris, um, sorry, Ning from Surrey and Harris from Lancaster will be talking about intent-based networking and work on DevOps and particularly network-focused DevOps. The third area we'll be looking at today is prognostics for service assurance. And adding intelligence to network assets offers the possibility that the infrastructure can trigger appropriate maintenance processes. And so with prognostic maintenance scheduling, we concentrate that engineering effort on reducing the risk to customer service and costs. And this is all about assets being able to learn from their own infrastructure and in experience of that infrastructure and form swarms of similar assets to anticipate their remaining useful life and cooperatively decide the best means to maintain service, potentially reconfiguring themselves or actually calling out for human help. And so at 11.45, Ajith from the University of Cambridge will be talking more about the work on prognostics for service assurance. And then finally, as we've touched on uh, a number of times in the presentation, we need to think about that call out to humans and dissolving decisions and actions from the infrastructure, whilst massively giving us greater efficiency and greater agility in response to the customer needs and network events, we find the human beings that then run and operate the business now act with a hugely augmented power, but they need to trust that infrastructure. They need to understand what it's doing. And if they're called upon to intervene, then of course need to be given relevant information, useful recommendations, and a, and a view of the state of play. And so um, as this final uh, presentation for this morning's set, we'll be examining those challenges around governance and risk management. And so in the final of those presentations before lunch, Philip from the University of Cambridge will be talking around governance and risk management. So in today's presentations, we're getting a glimpse into the different aspects of, of NGCDI. We're going to see four key areas within the, within the programme that have been a huge um, effort for the project. And we're going to go through a number of those areas that bring out different aspects of our architecture. But of course, what's important is that whilst we're placing the spotlight on some of these key areas this morning through the presentations from Idris, uh, Ning, Harris, Ajith and Philip, um, whilst we're giving you an insight into some of those areas, there's a lot more details that you'll see within the breakout rooms this afternoon and an opportunity to get uh, access to demos, more participants within the project and ask direct questions of those and have those detailed conversations with the wider team and the research. So hopefully you'll find this afternoon a really real opportunity, whilst we can't meet in person, to have a, as close engagement as we possibly can in those breakout sessions. And of course, these just represent some of the areas of activity within the project. So what I would also encourage you to do um, in a moment is to also have a look at the NGCDI website, where you can find far more information about all of the other aspects of the programme. We've got videos from a number of our researchers that are carrying out exciting new research 
in, in many of the key areas we talked about today, but also in other areas that we just haven't been able to pack into today's uh, single day agenda. Um, and I do hope we'll have more chance to do that in an in-person event in the future. So I would encourage you to have a look at the, the material available on our website. Um, um, so without further ado, thank you for attending uh, today's event. I hope you find it um, really interesting and enjoyable. Um, feel free to ask questions on the chat. Um, and at this point, I will hand back to Paul. And I know we're, we're pressed for time, so I'll, I'll hand straight back to Paul.